Now let's talk about some applications of the probability concepts that we've learned. One important concept has to do with the safety first ratio. And this was developed by a person called Roy. So Roy's safety first criterion states that the optimal portfolio minimizes the probability that the return of the portfolio RP falls below some minimum acceptable level called RL. This minimum acceptable level is called the threshold level. The context might be that you might have a client who says that I just cannot stand returns less than 2%. So this 2% then becomes the threshold level and you need to define a portfolio that minimizes the probability of returns less than so minimizes the probability that returns will be less than two percent so let's say that you have the possibility of building two possible portfolios a and b on a the expected return is high let's say expected return is about 15 percent but the possibility of returns falling below 2% are still there because you have this area under the curve that's less than 2% versus another portfolio B where the return is much less than 15%. So let's say here the return is only expected return is 10% but the riskiness is less because the probability of falling below 2% is much lower for portfolio B. So when you apply the safety first ratio, you will notice that we get a better ratio for B and hence given this criteria, B is the better portfolio. So from an exam perspective, you must know how to calculate the safety first ratio, which is simply the expected return on the portfolio minus the threshold value divided by the by the portfolio uh, standard deviation. Now let's look at our example over here. Let's say that on portfolio A, I've already given you that the expected return on the portfolio is equal to 15%, but the standard deviation is relatively high. Let's say it is 20%. So what's the safety first ratio? It will be 15 minus the standard dv 15 minus the threshold value which i gave as 2 so 15 minus 2 divided by 20 and let's just do that quickly on our calculators so 13 divided by 20 is equal to 0 0.65 and for portfolio b the safety first value is 10 minus 2 divided by let's take a much smaller standard deviation here let's say sigma for b is 5 percent so here you have 5 so 8 divided by 5 which is 1.6 now b has a higher safety first ratio and hence is the safer and better portfolio given this criteria the the way you can interpret this is as follows the safety first ratio so if you have this expected return the safety first ratio so if the it basically gives you a number on the horizontal axis so 0.65 means that your z value is minus 0 0.65 1.6 means that the z value is negative 1.6 so the higher the higher the safety first ratio the further to the left we will be on the probability distribution and therefore the probability the cumulative probability will be less the higher the safety first ratio if you got this part great if not not such a big deal what you must do is memorize this formula and memorize the fact that you select the portfolio with the highest safety first ratio. Higher the safety first ratio, lower the probability of falling in the zone where the investor does not want to fall. So do a quick example, portfolio 1, what's the safety first ratio, portfolio 2, portfolio 3, 
so safety first ratio we for for a it would be 13 minus the acceptable return of 6 so 13 minus 6 divided by 5 and then for portfolio b it would be 11 minus 6 divided by 3 and portfolio c 9 minus 6 divided by 2 find the 3 and pick the one which has the highest safety first ratio that is the safest log normal distribution a log so just understand what this dis distribution means first and then we'll talk about its application a log normal distribution is generated by the function e to the power of x where x is normally distributed since the natural log ln of e to the power of x therefore uh, the ln of e to the power of x is x so ln of e to the power of x is equal to x the logarithms of the log normal distribution are normally distributed and hence the name so the log of this distribution is normal so what are we what are we saying here we are saying that take any point on this distribution so let's say mu is 0 if you take the log of uh, let's say mu is so mu is 0 and e to the power of 0 so when we go from here to here the transformation is e to the power of x so e to the power of 0 is 1 so 0 point over here would correspond to 1 over here minus so if you are way back let's say minus 1000 so what is e to the power of uh, e to the power of minus 1000 would be a very small number so it would still be positive because e to the power of anything has to be positive so it would be a very small number and if you move way to the right then e to the power of 1000 would give you very high numbers so going from left to right the transformation is e to the power of x and going from right to left we are simply taking the log of this distribution the log of this distribution will give us a normal distribution hence the term so if you remember the phrase log is normal then all this makes sense okay from an exam perspective what's actually more important is this slide you need to recognize that a log normal distribution is skewed to the right the log normal distribution is bounded from below by zero so that it is useful for modeling asset prices which never take negative values so if you are modeling asset prices like price of asset a is 40 the asset price can never go below zero and hence using a normal distribution which can go below zero would not make sense for assets because this price can never go below zero hence log normal distributions are used to model asset prices and it doesn't make sense to use a regular normal distribution to model asset prices so these are the two most important points when it comes to a log normal distribution In this reading, it seems a little out of place, but there is this concept of price relative and the distinction between continuous compounding and the stated annual rate. So let's just understand the concepts because they are part of this reading. What's a price relative? It is the end of period value divided by the beginning of period value. So if you start the period at a stock price of 100, end of period it's 120 your price relative is simply 120 over 100 which is equal to 1.2 now what's the holding period return so the holding period return for this period is 20 percent so that's 1.2 minus 1 so holding period return is 20 percent this is also your effective since our holding period is one year this is also our effective annual return now if we know that our effective annual return is 20 percent what is the stated return so this is the effective return assuming continuous compounding 
what is the stated return or the annual return if we if if we do not have continuous compounded the way you do that is you simply say ln of 1.2 so if we do that on our calculators so 1.2 ln you will see that ln of 1.2 is 0 0.18 so our stated return is 0.18 or 18%. Now if a stock's initial price is 20 and from 20 the end of year price is 23, what is the continuously compounded or stated rate? First let's make sure we know what the effective annual rate is. So the effective annual rate is and this whenever we deal with stock prices we assume continuous compounded so effective annual rate is from 20 to 23 so this is 3 over 20 which is 15 percent how do you what's the fastest way of computing the continuously compounded or the stated rate the answer is we do ln of the price multiple so you do ln of 23 over 20 and that will give you so let's do 23 divided by 20 is equal to 1.15 and you take the ln of that that will give you 0 0.139 so the correct answer is 13.98 percent so that's the correct answer Finally, this reading wants this reading covers the Monte Carlo simulation, and uh, this is a hugely important area in finance. But in this reading, you just need to understand a few core concepts. Monte Carlo simulation is a computer-based technique based on the repeated generation of one or more risk factors that affect security values. For each of the risk factors, the analyst specifies the parameters of the probability distribution. Each set of randomly generated risk factors is used with a pricing model to value the security. The procedure is repeated many times and the distribution of simulated asset values is used to draw inferences about expected mean value of the security and possibly the variance of security values about the mean as well. What does all this mean? Again, best understood with an example. Let's say that you want to simulate the mean and the variance of this complicated mortgage-backed security. And the way you can, and let's say that there is no simple formula that allows you to come up with the appropriate numbers. So what do you do? You, you have to use Monte Carlo simulation, which requires a lot of computation. And you say that for this mortgage-backed security, the price depends on three risk factors, A, B, and C. So these risk factors might be things like interest rates, number of housing starts, and so on. So we don't need to get into those details right now, but let's just say that there are three risk factors, A, B, and C. What you input into the computer then is the distribution, the possible distribution of these three risk factors. So the distribution could be anything. So based on your knowledge of this area, you specify the risk factors and the possible values that these risk factors can take. And the way you specify the possible values is you input the possible probability distribution of the three risk factors. Then what the computer will do is run millions of simulations so, so it will take, for every simulation, it will take one possible value of the risk factors and then, and then it will calculate the value of the security based on the values of the risk factors. So it will do this once and then in the second iteration it will take another possible set of values for the risk factors, come up with another value for the security and so on. So it will do this a million times and based on then doing this a million times what, what the computer will generate is, uh, is the possible distribution 
of the MVS prices. So based on all this data, the computer will then generate a output which represents the distribution of possible values for the security that you are analyzing. So extremely powerful and used a lot in the finance industry. What are the applications? Uh, I would just suggest that you memorize these. Uh, major applications include projecting the interaction of pension assets and liabilities, developing estimates of value at risk. So if you have a portfolio, you know, you need to specify with a certain probability how much value is at risk. You will see this in more detail at levels 2 and 3 of the CFA. Uh, estimating the potential success of a given trading strategy, estimating the distribution of return of a portfolio composed of assets that do not have normally distributed returns, estimating the distribution of an asset that has features such as embedded options, call features, and parameters that change as market conditions change. So you will understand some of this material as we do fixed income securities later in the course, but for now I'd suggest that you just read this a few times and try to memorize these points. What are some limitations of the Monte Carlo simulation? The Monte Carlo simulation, the limitations of the Monte Carlo simulation are that it is fairly complex and will provide answers that are no better than the assumptions about the distributions of risk factors and the pricing valuation model that is used. Also, simulation is not an analytic method but a statistical one and cannot provide the insights that analytical methods can. So nevertheless, despite this limitation, Monte Carlo simulations are used a lot in finance as well as in other industries. As opposed to Monte Carlo simulation, we can also have historical simulations that use historical data to generate the sets of realized random variables as opposed to a random number generator as in the Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo method uses random numbers to project what possible values the risk factors might take, whereas historical simulations simply use historical data. What are limitations of historical simulations? Historical simulations can not take into account the effects of significant events that did not occur during the sample period. For example, if a particular security only came into existence after 1987, we do not have observations for its behavior during a market crash. So basically, we are limited by the historical data, and if the historical data is not uh, indicative of what will happen in the future, then obviously historical simulations are not very useful. Finally, historical simulations cannot perform what-if analysis. The source of the sample data is a fixed set, fixed set and we cannot investigate the effects of changing parameters in certain ways. So if your risk factors are A, B, C and you are using Monte Carlo and you change your view about a given risk factor, so for example, you know, this is number of housing starts and you change your view on what the mean or the variance is, then that can happen in a Monte Carlo simulation but in a historical simulation, you are just working with given historical data and cannot change history. So you can't do what-if analysis because the historical data is static. So that is it. Again, as I keep saying, make sure you go back and practice as many questions as possible on this reading.